Welcome back to Reading Bear. Today, we will take a look at some new Mauritius compliance stories. And if you enjoyed my content, please don't forget to subscribe to my channel and post some bear emojis in the comments. Let's go! First one is titled, Throw me under the bus? No problem. I work as a hospital liaison for an elderly community, specifically for the skilled nursing end, 24-7 nursing care and rehab. My job is to go into the hospitals when they have a patient in need of skilled nursing placement and meet them at the bedside to answer their clinical questions. I've been doing this around 10 years now. Since the pandemic hit, I haven't been able to go into the hospital, so I have been relegated to be in the facility and handle all marketing and incoming admissions. We recently lost our administrator who I was very close with and trusted me completely. Enter K, the interim administrator. K seemed nice enough at first, however I found it odd she was always telling me in private how her family in Nigeria was super rich and didn't even need to work. Cool. Whatever. Slowly rumors were going around the management team that K was throwing people under the bus for her errors. Now it should be said, K and corporate never bothered me or micromanaged, as my facility has had the consistently highest census since I started, so my job is pretty damn secure. This past week, I had an admission coming in who had been with us in the past and was a challenging one, verbally aggressive behaviors. I have been told by our corporate office this is never a reason to deny a patient, since if we can accommodate a dementia patient, this should be nothing out of the ordinary. Prior to this patient coming in, I discussed the challenges of the patient with our management team and sent a detailed email to Kay and the clinical team at the facility laying out the challenges and how to handle them. As soon as this patient admits, the behaviors begin. This patient is in the early stages of dementia, and normal behavior for her is to claim she is being abused, she hasn't been, all interactions are documented and two staff must always go in together to provide care. The abuse claims come to Kay, and she pulls me into her office immediately, screaming that she needs to oversee my admitting process and how could I ever allow this patient into the building without letting her and the team know. I calmly told her I had, and told her to check the email I sent as well. Kay claims she never got an email, and that this was completely my fault, and now she needs to report the abuse claims to the state. She's right, she does, totally agree. Kay tells every single person in the company this is my fault, and I'm putting our patients in jeopardy with my carelessness. The team started to turn against me because of this. I kept my mouth shut because I knew the truth and my top supervisor is the national director of sales and always has my back. Kay writes up the abuse report and sends it to the state, as well as campus management, and my supervisors, she only needed to send it to the state. My top supervisor calls me to find out what the hell happened. I explain and he pauses, you need to see this. He forwards me the abuse claim she submitted to the state and oh my god. Kay had pinned the entire situation on me, saying that due to my negligence in preparing our staff and team, it resulted in abuse to a resident blah blah blah. All lies. I smiled and told my supervisor about the detailed email I had sent out prior to admission with Kay clearly cc'd on it. My supervisor tells me to forward that to him immediately and he will take care of it. I came in this morning, and Kay was gone. She was let go immediately once the email was seen and corporate realized she had lied in an official abuse document to the Illinois Department of Health, and is now under investigation. Her administrator license is now also in question, and has to appear before a board to determine if she can keep her healthcare administration license. Once the team learned the truth, and Kay was gone, I went from villain to hero in a day. Next one is titled, Tell me to drop the class if I don't like your rules? Okay, then you'll lose 5 students and your job. This happened years ago but a post on here reminded me of it. So when I was a freshman in college I registered for a basic English 102 course that doubled as a humanities credit. I thought great, two birds one stone, despite the rate my professor for this class being abysmal at best. A few things to note, I have ADHD and dyslexia, so I have a hard time reading most times but especially handwritten stuff. Even my own. It's also important to note that I had an ADA allowance on file, meaning I get some permission to allow me to take classes and function as normally as possible. 
These permissions included use of my tablet during class to write notes and about an hour longer on tests. Well first day of class, the professor strolls in with the arrogance and snobitude of someone who thinks they're getting tenured this year. He starts talking, going over the syllabus and says, there will be no phones, laptops or technology of any kind in my class. You will write all your notes by hand, which isn't going to work for me, so I raise my hand and ask him if I can talk to him privately about the rule. That went over about as well as a lead ballon and he starts getting snippy and says anything you need to talk with me about can be found in the syllabus. But again I said that I needed to talk to him and that it was pretty important. Finally he just says to say it to the class, he doesn't have time to take out to deal with whining of any kind. Like okay dude. So I say that I'm dyslexic and need my tablet to do the notes and read the assignments, and that my ADA permissions are on file and emailed to all my professors before class. He says, yeah I saw the email, but I don't care. You can do the work just like everyone else, you're not special even if you were in special ed, the class goes deadly quiet at that. I'm absolutely shocked at his bold and completely hilarious lack of awareness and care for his job. I'm staring at him open-mouthed and he thinks he's one. He's got this smug little face like I've just been told and there are no other options nor is there any way he'll regret his behavior. One of the girls in class finally finds her voice and calls hung out in his ableism and lack of decorum, but he cuts her off saying, if you don't like my rules, you can drop the class. So she says, okay, and pulled out her laptop and dropped the class right in front of him, and taking the cue from her three other students and I do the same and we leave class together. At the same time, I've never met this girl before, but she then asks me if I want to go to the dean because honestly I'm really shaken so I said yes and we go straight there telling the dean of students what happened as well as the Ada counselor. They took the girl's statement and mine, and discovered that this professor had pulled this crap for years but nobody wanted to get involved. Six months later I hear that not only had the professor not gotten tenured, but he was fired and blacklisted from teaching at the collegiate level. Next one is titled, Driver's License. Which one? I was reminded of this exchange by an earlier post. These events took place about 20 years ago now, in Australia. In the late 1990s we moved to the UK for a couple of years from our home in Sydney, New South Wales, Australia. About six months prior to leaving I had to renew my New South Wales licence, which I'd held for nearly 20 years. The New South Wales Roads and Traffic Authority cancelled the old one by punching a hole in it and giving me a new one. I got to keep the old one. In the UK at the time you just rocked up to the Department of Motor Vehicles, filled out a form, handed over your valid Australian license and a handful of pounds and they issued a new UK license, no questions asked. So, now I have an old, expired New South Wales license and a current UK license. Forward a few years and back in Canberra, ACT Australia. When I got to the ACT Motor Registry I applied to convert my current UK license to an ACT license. No. If you're coming from a UK license you need to sit a road rules test first. Test will be 50 bucks please, done when we're ready in a few days, says the nice lady at the counter. Protests that I was a passported Australian citizen, that I'd been an Australian driver for 20 years, showing the fine print on the UK license that I was able to drive, and showing the old New South Wales license cut no ice at all. UK to ACT equals road rules test. No road rules test equals no ACT license. The end. Then the nice lady said, if you were trying to transfer from another Australian license I could do it immediately. So, while both my current UK license and the old, now three years expired New South Wales license were sitting on the counter between us I reached over, retrieved the UK license and said, I'd like to transfer from this old expired New South Wales license to an ACT license please. She looked me squarely in the eye, paused to take stock, and said, OK. I walked out five minutes later a bona fide ACT driver. And still with a valid UK license too. Make of that what you will. Next one is titled, The Onion Man. About eight years ago I used to work at a sandwich shop, bakery. We'd have all kinds of regulars that would come in. Some were wonderful people, some you hoped got in a car accident after they left. There was a gentleman who would come in every so often who was part of the ladder. 
I named this individual the Onion Man because his mo was that he absolutely loved onions and you can go die in a fire if you stood in the way of that. If there wasn't enough onion on his ham and Swiss on rye, you could potentially be wearing his sandwich. Nobody told me that during my third day on the job. I put on the amount of onions any rational human would want but I guess that's where I messed up. I must have caught him on a good day because all he did was tell me that my mother shouldn't sleep around because to makes meaningless people like myself. Management served these regulars for decades so they aren't going to burn the bridge of repeat business to make some new kid working in a sandwich shop feel better. They just told me to put more next time. Well fast forward a month and the onion man shows up again. He remembers me almost immediately. He told me to make it quick and get it right because he is in a hurry and needs it to go. Like a good soldier I snap to and get ready to make his order. But then he throws in a, is that too much for you, at the end. I was fully prepared to make this order as fast as I could because this guy sucks and I wanted him out of my face. But I didn't even get a chance to screw up his order yet and he was already insulting me. So after I read back his order, stressing his extra onions, I tell him it's only going to be a few minutes as I need to prep more onions for his order. I thank him for his patience and head to the back. I assemble his sandwich there to save time and I start prepping onions. He wants extra onions? I'll make sure he gets them. So I slice up 7 whole onions, load them on the sandwich, around the sandwich, and on top of the sandwich and wrap it all tightly in paper and bag it. I hand it to the guy and he tells me that it better have what he wanted or he'll be back. So I told him that I learned the first time and I won't make that mistake again. He had the most smug grin I've ever seen and left. Nothing really happened to me. I did see the onion man back a few other times but he wouldn't talk to me and only wanted the manager to make his food ever since. Turns out they were military buddies or something. I didn't really care enough to find out more. Next one is titled, I need a reservation when your dining room is empty? This happens a few years ago but I still hold a grudge against this restaurant. My brother and wife came to visit and there was an upper class restaurant around the corner. One of those places with fancy tablecloths where they would remove crumbs from your table in front of you while serving the next course. They touted an awesome Sunday brunch and had a lot of advertisement around it. We decided we'd have brunch there. Now we live in a very casual city, very few places have an enforcer dress code. So Sunday morning we show up in Sunday best aka girls in casual summer dresses and heels, boys in nice jeans and collared shirts. The place was empty as we arrived around the time they opened. We came in and asked for a table for five and were asked if we had a reservation. We responded no and the girls started giggling and didn't respond. They leave, scurry away from the host table and start talking to the manager. The manager walks over after about 10 minutes later and says they are so sorry they cannot seat us without a reservation. We were bummed and our group ended up stopping just inside the door of the restaurant in like a big waiting area and try to figure out where to go for brunch instead. I don't know how to say this other than flat out, they were stinking rude about the whole thing. How dare we come without a reservation type attitude. My sill silently whips out her phone, launches open table, a restaurant reservation platform, and she stomps back to the host table and shows that there are 60 open reservations, for varying party sizes. As she stares at the manager and two hostesses she, while fully displaying the phone to them, selects book for a table. Then immediately proclaims, we have a reservation. They sat us immediately and we had a leisurely brunch with drinks and food. We were seated for probably an hour and a half. The restaurant never reached, in my opinion, even 25% capacity while we were there. Next one is titled, I have to book on the phone? Okay. My uncle has never been one to suffer horrible people or give much time to unnecessary rules and pointless guidelines. A couple of years back, he happened to be passing his doctor's surgery and had to make a non-urgent appointment for some time the following week. Thinking it would be easier to just pop in quickly as opposed to waste time on a phone call, he went in and spoke to the receptionist. He got around halfway through his, hello, I'd like to make an appointment, spiel when the receptionist interrupts him, with her voice raised and her tone clearly saying she thought he was a cretin, to say he could only book on the phone and was wasting his time. 
If it hadn't been for her attitude, my uncle is pretty laid back and it wouldn't really have been any skin off his nose to just head home and give them a call a bit later, the appointment wasn't urgent. However, the thing he hates more than anything in the world is rudeness. So, the compliance begins. He thanks the woman very politely, apologizes for wasting her time, and leaves the surgery. However, he doesn't go far. He literally stands at the glass door, maybe a meter away from the reception desk, and takes out his phone. The receptionist hasn't noticed he's still there, so when the phone rings and she answers it, taking her sweet time as well, she immediately recognizes his voice, very cut glass, distinctive accent and style of speech, looks up in shock and makes eye contact with my uncle on the other side of the glass door, staring pointedly at her while holding his phone against the ear and politely requesting an appointment. He got his appointment. The receptionist was a lot less chippy when they interacted in the future. All good, and he loves telling this story, he doesn't on first meet seem like someone who'd even consider doing something like that which makes this so much more satisfying. Next one is titled, You Need the Restaurant's Name on This Receipt? Sure. This is a story told to me by my dad who recently retired from a Fortune 500 company headquartered locally. He was an engineer and every month or so he and his work group would have an outing to a restaurant in the area, chosen by one of the work group members. The company would pay for the lunch as long as an expense report with a proper receipt was filed. This particular time, one engineer, we'll call her Patricia, decided to take the group to a hole in the wall bar known for its coney dogs. Let's call this place, the Badger Bar. Everything went fine, everyone enjoyed their conies, and Patricia got a handwritten receipt, hole in the wall place, didn't have printed receipts, on a generic piece of paper. The problem came after Patricia turned the expense report in. It was returned to her with a note stating the charges were denied. It may have been included in the note, or she may have had to talk to someone in accounting, but she found out the receipt didn't count because the restaurant's name wasn't on it, and anyone could write a fake receipt. So Patricia had to go back to the badger. She took the receipt, went up to the bartender and explained the situation. Here's the malicious compliance. The bar had a number of stickers that could be handed out as promotional materials. The bartender could have grabbed a sticker that simply had the bar's name on it. Instead, he went right for the pre-printed sticker, remember, this is a real hole in the wall place, that stated, eat a coney at the badger bar or get ducked. Patricia gladly took the receipt with the new sticker back and resubmitted her expense report. She was called into a meeting with HR a few days later for an unprofessional expense report. She simply stated, accounting asked for the restaurant's name and that was the sticker they gave me. No longer term consequences as far as I know, and the group still has the Badger Bar on their restaurant rotation. Last one is titled, I'm not allowed to cook food off my own judgment in a semi-busy fast food restaurant, KFC, and can only cook when you tell me to. Enjoy the coming storm of crap. So my previous job was as a cook at a local KFC which was one of the faster ones in the area. I had been there for three and a half years and didn't really have too many problems with management and I was actually friends with some of them. But then one of the senior staff got promoted to a shift runner and that's when this already average job got worse. To put it into perspective because I had been at the job for a couple of years doing the same thing daily I knew my crap, I knew how much chicken we would need on a given night and I could pretty much do my chicken runs by myself and all the other managers let me do it because they were often too busy to watch and manage chicken. This newly promoted manager didn't like that I was bypassing her in the so-called chain of command and not listening to projections which were inaccurate the majority of the time and started getting annoyed. Sure sometimes we had a bit of wastage but everyone else agreed it was better to have a couple of pieces left over than to make a customer wait 30 minutes continuously. So this manager had a go at me and our conversation went like this. Manager, prankish space for you're not allowed to cook what you want. You have to wait till I tell you what to cook and cook exactly the amount I tell you to. Me, even when it is super busy you want me to interrupt you packing orders and making burgers to get you to tell me what I already know needs cooking. Manager, yes I don't care how busy I will tell you what to cook you have to wait for me to tell you. This happened on a Tuesday night the busiest night at KFC where I lived due to a promotion on chicken, 9 pieces for $10.95. 
so I didn't cook unless she told me to and in a matter of 30 to 45 minutes we were out of the original and spicy chicken with drive through full and many customers waiting on chicken. The manager walks out back and me and the other cook are laughing cleaning things and sweeping the floor. No chicken was down the fryers were on cool so it would take a bit to heat up and nothing was set up. The manager proceeded to yell at us asking why there was no chicken cooking and saying customers were waiting and they were completely out. I just turned to her and said, well you told me today I couldn't cook without permission and you haven't told us to cook for the past hour. The amount of complaints and upset customers having a go at staff members was insane. Sure I was behind for the remainder of my shift and we got a lot of flack from customers that night but she started letting us cook to judgment from then on. Plenty more stories of bullshit from KFC of illegal things happening. Super glad to be out of that crap hole. Thanks for listening.